Good evening and welcome to another episode of A Politically Incorrect Guyana. My name is Kian Jabour and as usual I am your host this evening. So we've had a long week and I first want to say I deeply apologize for not being able to make it last week. I um I had a outreach that I did in Essequibo um and I was able to go down there and talk to some farmers and some community people, um cash crop farmers, fishermen, so um I really wasn't able to be in the studio and my apologies once again but I am back here this uh this evening and I have a wonderful show for you guys. I have a special guest. All right, um somebody that I got very close to in the 2020 elections. Um my guest and I got uh, got a chance to really dive into the belly of the beast of politics and what it's about during um our campaign in 2019 2018 leading up to 2020 and then obviously the 2020 scenario that uh, that took place um my guest was able to be one of the leaders and um driving forces behind making the public uh, aware of what was taking place communicating with the international community and really had a chance to um you know to 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 show Guyana what she um uh, was made of as a leader and i think a lot of people were able to see that uh come out in her and a couple others and um i uh i as as time went on and elections happened um uh we got even funny enough we got even closer because we had a lot of the same ideologies in politics and um it's somebody that i think a lot of people not only in her own professional industry but in guyana as a whole look up to as one of our up and coming future leaders so without further ado let me welcome my guest miss asha kisun dr asha kisun <laughs> good night everyone it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight asha you know you and i always have the best conversations we are some we're, we the two of us get together quite regularly and um we have a lot of the same political ideas and we honestly at the belly of it we really just like to see what's best for guyana i mean um as much as politics in itself is so consuming here in guyana it's so important for people to understand that you know when people like yourself and i get politically involved a lot of a lot of times you know people say well you know if you want to make a change and people have these ideas that if you want to make real change why not just join the two big parties and fight it from within but asha you and i are two people that obviously decided you know what we are suck of a punishment <laughs> <laughs> so we have the 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 the, the third party ideology so tell me asha um you know when it comes to politics what made you jump straight into third parties rather than go into you know PPP or APNU. Okay, and the truth is I wanted to see improvement. We have been in a political system for more than 50 years with a two party lead in this country. And due to the call of the Guyanese people, the people themselves asked for this. And I do it not for personal gain or fame, but to represent those persons who do not believe in the two party system. And in order for us to bring improvement and real change to the political landscape, we needed to be independent. And this is something we have maintained from the very beginning to now. You remember when we got in? I was accused of being PPP because I'm Indian. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's always persons target you because of race. How you look? How yeah. you look? Because yeah. maybe you spoke to somebody at some point in time. <laughs> picture was taken. And yes, <laughs> pictures are taken. So let me let me ask Asha. Um you know, since um the the elections happened in 2020 and the PPP took power, during that whole election saga previous to that, um you know, we we a lot of people wondered why we were supporting the the idea that the ppp won the election and a lot of people believed it was because we were ppp surrogates or sent there by the ppp <laughs> no. so what i'd like to ask you and you know feel free to tell the public especially now i bring this up as an interesting topic because march 2nd was was the swearing in yes. of the government um uh 2 years ago 
So uh, let me ask you, what is it that 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 you are dealing with now versus then um, when it came to, you know, public reaction to who you are as somebody that was supporting and fighting for free and fair elections, which which indirectly meant the PPP going into power versus now somebody that is kind of um, making sure that you're doing your best to hold them accountable. What 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 are you dealing with on that end? Tell okay, me. Okay, and the truth is that um, I was never fighting for the PPP. I'm always on the side of the truth. And the truth is there weren't free and fair elections. March 2nd mm -hmm. was actually the election saga. The swearing in happened until September. Mm -hmm. But that aside, what was important is my role was representing the Guyanese people, ensuring that their votes counted, ensuring that the correct party, whether it was PPP or APNU, got into government according to the votes. We supported the national recount. We stood up. I stood up for the Guyanese people, not for the PPP. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm not here tonight to bash the government. I'm not here yeah. to bash the APNU. I'm here to stand up for issues and political ideologies as requested by the Guyanese people. They need that voice, and that's why we are here now. Excellent, excellent. Well, on that note, you know what is the most burning topic? The joiner list is in the process right now of of having their transition. And, you know, it's no secret I, I'm ANUG and you yourself are TNM, two organizations that are part of the joiner. Now that uh, Mr. Lennox Schumann, his time is up in PPP, uh, sorry, in Parliament, um, what, exa <laughs> <don't laugh. laughs> what exactly, don't laugh, what exactly, what exactly when your time starts in Parliament, what exactly do you feel um, are some of the issues that you need to bring to the forefront in Parliament and and in that type of of, of atmosphere where the country's um, you know the country's laws and regulations and policies are made? What when in that type of of setting do you think are the issues on the forefront right now affecting Guyanese people that you need to address? Well, first I must say it is an immense, immense honor to be able to represent the Guyanese people as independent opposition in parliament. And let me touch on that point before I go on to my issues. I would like them to understand the old party system has suppressed us in the sense that it's either government or opposition. Opposition falls on the APNU. Please, I would like the people to know that we are not part of the major opposition. We are independent opposition. And the issues and topics that we stand on are for the people of Guyana, not supporting a political party per se. Mm -hmm. All right? I'm very passionate about constitutional reform. And it is something that has been... Both government and opposition have been avoiding it because it works for their benefit. Mm -hmm. A perfect example, in GCOM, we as independent opposition have no representation. We cannot represent the people who follow us mm -hmm. when it comes to GCOM and issues of election. It is mainly driven by PPP and APA. Completely driven. Yes. Three, three on each side. And, and we the chairman. deserve to be able to represent our Guyanese people in that aspect. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. Constitutional reform where the joiner is confirmed concerned is very important. We made Absolutely. history. This is the first time political parties were able to put aside pride, put aside everything else, and come together for the benefit of the people. So there will be policies and propositions towards improving how we can represent the Guyanese people. One of the things you saw how much the opposition gets, right? Well, that's a good, that's a good, as a matter of fact, a lot of, a lot of viewers don't know that. And it's something Ash and I were just discussing that um, in order to, to prove that um, constitutional reform is necessary, um, you have to understand that the laws and the rules in parliament are perpetuated to 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 create a two-party system these these laws are are built in a way that only two parties should be able to have a voice in this country and that creates the winner take all system and one of those rules are that a lot of taxpayers don't know this um that the the um part of the budget every year allocates a certain amount of taxpayers dollars to support the office of the main opposition. 
meaning in this case APNU and previous um, election was uh, was PPP, and right now they're giving about three thousand three sorry three million dollars a month. Thirty seven. The yeah. said. With thir thirty seven over the year. Yes. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is, you know, I was listening to the um, the vice president's uh, uh, press conference this afternoon, and it was very interesting because it was you know. It, as you can tell, the, 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 the government and the opposition and the main opposition have gone fully into campaign mode. And every time they speak, they have to kind of go at each other and attack on, on, on something that um, the other one is doing or didn't do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was very interesting to hear the vice president speak so badly of, of what the main opposition, APNU AFC, is doing to Guyana and did to Guyana yet the taxpayers are still funding them yes. you know and it's so interesting because it's, it's it's a perfect example of them speaking about oh we need better and we need to do better but let's not change anything yes let's make sure it's just the two of us so we could bark at each other and 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 create drama so that it, people cannot um really see all that we're doing it, it, it really is a wonderful tactic of deflection rather than speak about what we're doing and what what's happening we're speaking like I, I found it so funny because the big issue in the in the um in the media right now and and internationally as far as guyana is concerned is guyana has is on its way to a suspension on the in um yes. extractions um transparency institute meaning it's an organization put together to monitor all the oil yes. companies and extraction companies around the world to make sure that the governments of those countries are doing what's best for not only for the people of the country, but also um, in the industry. So they don't, don't have any oil spills. So the money is not just stolen, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And Guyana right now, through their own fault of, of, of not submitting any reports, but, but, but claiming to be transparent, the, the Institute has now threatened. But what's very interesting is, yeah. You know, well, we are remembering election time 2020. And this is something both of us have campaigned on strongly, the lack of transparency. Yeah. And an observation is that this is still happening. Mm -hmm. All these years after, we still cannot see full accountability yeah. of what's happening. And something that was brought to my attention, I mean, once again, I'm not criticizing. This is Guyanese citizens reaching out to me, letting me know what their concerns are is that government is heavily invested in business. Mm -hmm. The private sector is not having room to blossom and bloom as they would like. Mm -hmm. All the major industries, government is right in it. And they're expressing, the people themselves are expressing dissatisfaction. Something like the oil refinery, the gas to shore project, mm -hmm. um, the falls, the hydroelectricity falls. Everything the government is directly in. Mm -hmm. When there are private sector persons who can fund it, do it. Right. You see, so absolutely, the people need to be given a chance. Interesting. Interesting. It, including the oil and gas industry. Yeah. I understand they should be informed. There should be transparency. But does the deep involvement need to be there? That that's such an interesting concept because it's this whole idea of decentralizing this power, and you know we 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 have a history in Guyana, of the governments of the day whoever it is always wanting to have their hand in every aspect of business in this country and you see it in every industry i mean you, well you watch what happened with the sugar industry tragedy i mean you look they, they control gpl um you know look at look at rice the rice uh, they have the grdb monitoring that um, that sector and you know in every private sector area there has to be some sort of government control if you will and exactly what you're saying you wonder if it really is a free a free market that is, is don't, it's claimed don't to get me wrong they should be to a level involved they Absolutely. should be aware of what's happening but it's a little concerning mm -hmm. to see that given the track record that they continue to go down that line yeah absolutely i'm on board with you you know i it's funny because you know i look at a lot of the 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 core industries in this country the industries that have kept us afloat before oil and one of them being rice farming mm -hmm. and um you know i'm part of the grdb board and i know that the board itself you know has a lot of good people on it and a lot of um 
a lot of players in the actual rice industry that are really wanting and trying to see different. But the reality is, unless because it's still a government institution, there's only so much that the board can do. And as we can tell right now, I mean, I know all the rice farmers watching this and millers at the moment know that the industry is in crisis. Yes. And it's, you know, that's actually why I ended up going to Esequibo, because there's so much happening right now as a core industry. I mean, even in mining or, or, or timber, it's across fishing, the fisheries, you know, the, the, the fishing sector. These industries are all contracted completely. And, you know, it was very quickly and lightly brushed over in the budget speeches because the oil industry has the economy looking wonderful and the GDP. But the truth of the matter is those prime fundamental industries are all taking a hit. And unless more attention is paid, you know, it, it, they're going to crumble. And the last thing we want is to have to depend on the oil industry only. And I'm trying to, to show, and, you know, I had a wonderful conversation that there's so many options and there's definitely no you know, it's not a dark, long tunnel. There is definitely light there. It just needs to have the opportunity to shine. You know what I'm concerned about? And I'm actually very concerned about it. To be fair, I have seen the government diversifying into other sectors than mm. the oil and gas, and I give them praise for that, into okay. agriculture, education, some extent in medicine. You know, mm -hmm. we have to give credit where it's due. And they have been making some excellent projects in those areas. But when it comes to the rice industry, the agricultural industry, what concerns me is the farmers are still not benefiting because instead of going towards end products and processing and industrialization, mm -hmm. we're still buying a coconut for $2. Somebody buys it $2, processes it, and sells it for $100. And the farmer is still making $2. Ah, interesting, interesting. And that concerns me. Yeah. More recent than rice is hemp. The hemp industry, the legislation was recently passed. A okay. year plus, we're still waiting on government to make a board led by a government official. Hemp should be in the private sector. Put your regulations, have it licensed, collect your taxes, yeah. but let the people plant it. Let the independent individuals be able to run their industry. Mm -hmm. Once yeah. again, it's government controlled. And when that happens, who suffers? The farmers yeah. are always getting the short end of the stick. They should be the richest persons in this country. We depend on them for food. We depend on them for sustainability. Guyana should be the breadbasket of the Caribbean. But they're always suppressed. Yeah. Because instead of supporting them into making end products, it's always the same. Look the thing with the soya beans. Mm -hmm. it's an excellent project. I give the PPP kudos for that and how many tons of soya will produce. But we're not hearing any talks about a tofu processing plant. We're not hearing anything about supporting the farmers into making end products. It's it's all, in, it's like yeah. you're digging a hole to fill another hole. Right, well, well, there you go, because as you're watching the rice industry crumble, they're looking to compensate with these other industries, but these industries are gonna end back up right in the same situation, yes. right? Because as you just said, I mean, the taxation is so heavy, the cost of production is so heavy, that the farmers themselves, I mean, I can tell you right now, even the millers are taking a hit, yes. right? And, and then you start to argue, and then you get into the larger scale conversation. You know, let's say you're producing soy and corn, you know, unless that is for personal consumption, uh, local consumption here in Guyana, how exactly are you competing with Brazil and America with these products? You can't, you know, these, all these farms are highly subsidized. So on the international market, just like the rice industry is dealing with, your price is going to be higher to produce. Yes. So who's going to buy it? You know what I mean? And these are not bigger scales of what I find a lot of times. It's unfortunate because I like the ideas of diversification, like you said. But then I wonder sometimes if it's just a headline that they're painting. Is it just something that you're saying you're doing, but in actual fact, there's no real sustainability or, 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 or foundation that they're built on? Once again, that's where private sector comes in. Comes in. Comes in. We need experts. Your team has experts. My yeah. team has experts. People who are skilled in urban development, agriculture, engineering, who work with us, advise us of how it could be. I'm sure government can have even more skilled people than this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but is it being done? The lack of transparency prevents us from knowing is mm -hmm. it done properly. So you're, you're, you're having a wonderful... Um, you're having a wonderful uh, conversation with me here about people that need to be put in place based on merit, not political people, not people that 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 campaign for the PPP so they got to get a job and and paid a big salary to 
to do something that they know nothing about. It's the same for the so, APNU if they were in. Absolutely. Not the people that campaigned for the APNU, not the people who supported an, uh, a Reagan of an election. Absolutely. Let me just put it out there. Yeah. But persons who are qualified, persons yeah. who are experts in their fields, and yeah. that's what this country needs. I'm, I, I Honestly, I'm getting tired of people that, that are loyal to their party before they're loyal to the country and we and, and i can tell you everybody out there every farmer every fisherman every construction worker every industry out there every policeman every teacher every nurse they know that they're dealing with people in there that that, that are put in place because of party loyalty and not because they're doing what's best for for everyone and the country and, and we're watching it over and over in every industry it's a sad reality because even the party supporters yeah. complain to us about it yeah. And something a lot of them ask me on a daily basis is, Doc, why are we getting anything from this oil money? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, before we get into oil money and so on, let me, let me touch on a topic here for me that's very interesting because I like the conversation of merit. Mm -hmm. You are a medical doctor, Dr. Kisun. All right. You are working in the public health system. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to I want to firstly make sure we know that there are boundaries in there in these types of conversations because you are a current employee in that system. You are a public servant and you have to understand um, much like sorry. Well, I have to understand because it's something you explained to me that you have to understand at the same time that, you know, it, there's a professionalism that you have to maintain while doing your job. Yes. All right. So I, I appreciate people like yourself that are doing your best to find the balance of what you can do professionally and what you need to do for the people of Guyana. So um, big in the headlines over the last couple of days is maternal care. Mm -hmm. I know you've been monitoring it yesterday. The, 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 one of the most horrific things you can see um, was uh, um, a young lady um, gave uh, had a c-section at study hospital and for two months later she was feeling these horrible pains in her stomach only to go back to the hospital to find out there's a pack of gauze that was left inside of her during after the c-section um the report came out just two weeks previous to that um or a couple of days previous to that in which maternal deaths were shown in for 2022 being about 17 or so well that were reported um and, you know, those numbers are for a population as small as ours are, and I mean this in, in the most harsh way, are downright unacceptable. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. As my father's a doctor, my father's a pediatrician here. And as, as, as a, the, the, the one core foundation of a functioning society has to at bare minimum be its health care. All right. Closely followed by security and education. Um, but you you're a doctor in a system that we're dealing with right now asha please talk to me tell me what's happening in the medical industry in the uh health system right now in guyana well i'll address the issue in a general aspect okay. i must note that since government has changed i've seen a lot of improvement good i have seen budget um inclusions for infrastructural changes the purchase of equipment, you know, we, we have felt it, all of us as healthcare professionals. We recently had an improvement in the salary scale. It's not ideal, it's not yet competitive in comparison to the rest of the Caribbean and the world, but they made an effort so far. What concerns me the most in the healthcare system right now, and not just myself, but many doctors, is the alarming rate that staff have been resigning from the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. Just last month, more than 30 nurses left. Wow. A large number of doctors. These persons are being recruited to mm -hmm. leave Guyana. This is draining our healthcare system, and that's what's directly impacting us. I'm not aware of that situation with the gauze left. I don't know why, but I can tell you something real that's happening. When the skilled midwives and registered nurses and our skilled doctors are taken, the system is drained. You're overworked. Mm -hmm. Mistakes will be made and it will continue to be made until that can be addressed. Okay. All right. But talk to me about solution. <laughs> they have been <laughs> training persons. Okay. The goal initiative taking persons from the interior so they can work in their regions. But my question is, is it enough? Mm -hmm. Hospitals are being made. If persons are not incentivized enough to stay, 
training them would not make a difference. But that's my as good soon, point. As soon yeah. as your training is complete and you serve the government for you your become couple a couple of years, yeah. you leave. And that's what's been happening. All right? These hmm. hospitals, a maternal child health hospital, doctors from the maternity ward have complained that they're expected to split their time between Georgetown Hospital and the new hospital that's coming. <laughs> and they are already suffering from burnout. Kian, do you know that on a worldwide scale, not just Guyana, mm -hmm. medical professionals are on the highest rate of suicide? No. Well, the things we do, we do this for the love of the people. Yeah. We don't do it for the money. If it were for the money, we wouldn't be here in Ghana, right? It doesn't, it, it's not for the money. We love our patients. We love persons. We help them. I say this to people. Being a doctor is a servant. Mm -hmm. We deal with spit, blood, urine, feces. It's not pretty. You know, death, all day. You know, everything from the is time horrible. somebody yeah. comes to you from 8 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, 4.35, it's person's problems, helping them to get better in the hospitals. I'm not saying they aren't negligent, negligent doctors out there. It mm -hmm. happens all over the world. Okay. But the majority of us are dedicated to our patients. And when we're restricted in certain ways, there was recently an issue with APNU um, ordering drugs and they expired because they were close to the expiration date. And right now we were suffering from a shortage. Mm -hmm. Government continuously puts out that no, we have all medication and I can I can tell you and not just myself Many persons have reached out to me. Yeah. There is a shortage. Yeah, we don't have all the medication that we need currently All right, but I can say not just myself But many health centers have been approached by them last month to give them a list of everything they need equipment medication whatever it is improvements that we would like to have for the health facilities it mm -hmm. has not yet happened but we are hoping that they fulfill the promise of sending us what we have requested to improve the healthcare system, mm -hmm. right? Is it, you must always keep positive. You yeah, know? absolutely, absolutely. But um, it's, it's a real problem. Patients, you see now with the short of staff, it takes a longer time to go through your patients per day, longer yeah. waiting times staff the few persons that are overworked they end up short tempered you cannot give yeah. the customer service uh, you know that, that's a big and complaint the love and care that they right. deserve and people feel like oh every time you go into public hospital everybody's so miserable and they treat me this way and i think and and that's a real problem but it is but you have to understand what we're dealing with alone working yeah. for all those hours for 12 hours now sometimes with, more <laughs> sometimes that's i'm not 100 sure that's legal it, <laughs> but um but the, i think you guys need to look into that but nonetheless um so asha as we need to understand at all times as two people that's looking for best in guyana and for the people of guyana what is it that is necessary to be done let's talk solutions how do we keep the doctors how do we keep the nurses tell and i don't I, I want it to be as extreme as possible you tell me what's necessary because as you just said 30 nurses over the memo went out over 30 nurses resigned and midwives um they're leaving on a regular basis doctors leaving and resigning paying themselves out of these contracts because they're saying even if we work part-time at a private clinic it is still the same money we're going to get for and work a regular amount of hours so my question is how is it that we're going to get people to stay in the system doctors and, and trained professionals guyana has to become competitive where medicine is concerned Mm -hmm. not just salary scale services okay. professionals all right we need to incentivize our staff to stay it is not it has not been done okay unfortunately right now the idea is my way or the highway that's what we're, the staff are told plain and straight Work. my way or the highway if you want to leave leave but then you got to pay yourself for the contract yes which is so so, <laughs> so, you're in a, so i mean you're a prisoner no let's not go that far but but i mean let's let's be understanding i mean all jokes aside this is a very serious situation it really is. this is what majority of the population of this country people that cannot afford private clinics people and and, and i'm going to be honest a lot of times the clin private clinics can't even offer you what is necessary no. that the public facilities offer so if we're running out of medical professionals I mean, uh, you know, I'm watching lots of the government putting in the budget. Oh, we're going to build this hospital and this specialty. Asha, who's working there? What is the plan? Exactly. That's a point that I love. Kian, the doctors, the nurses, the porters, the lab technicians, the technologists. 
it's the people that make those health facilities what they are. Mm -hmm. So you must make the people comfortable. Yeah. Not just salary wise, infrastructure wise. There are some mm -hmm. health facilities that are in terrible condition. I mean, anything outside of are Georgetown, you know, look at what's going on in West Ham, look Skeldon, yes. look at the horror stories from New Amsterdam. You, we know what's going on. It's, it's absolutely unacceptable doctors yeah. in the interior region are complaining there's no running water there is no electricity the toilets yeah. don't work yeah and they are forced to stay in these locations i personally know somebody that resigned very recently because he kept addressing the issues through his rho and nothing was done something else on the patient side that i would like to bring up is negligence in this country really runs wild I'm not saying all doctors are perfect, mm -hmm. but for the few negligent ones, what is being done? Have you heard of any cases, this woman with the gods, is it in court as yet? No, uh, uh, nothing is being done. So yeah. our patients need proper representation mm -hmm. for when they're mm -hmm. mistreated. Yeah, absolutely. And that is something absolutely. nobody speaks about, but absolutely. it needs to be done. Accountability for absolutely. your actions, especially where people's lives are concerned. We, we, we actually watch that a lot in North America. Doctors' licenses getting revoked, yes. and in England and so on, because negligence is we not acceptable. We recently right? had a doctor here who was not even a doctor. And no witness turned up to court, and he was practicing and seeing persons. Doesn't this tell you yeah. oh, how yes. little I remember this story now. our patients? Yeah. Are, can you? I cannot even begin Im to how, imagine I'm, I'm, what this guy has done to people. Oh no! And I can't. he walks free right now. He's probably a doctor somewhere else at the moment. Who knows? That's craziness, Asha. And our patients are not properly represented in this regard. You know, Asha, and we we. What what my problem is with this whole scenario is that you and I speaking about this from a very layman's terms, even even, you know, as as people in in the political system, but also you yourself being an actual working doctor. A lot of people don't understand. You're not a minister or somebody who got driver and house and bills taken care of. You actually work from every single day for 12 hours as a doctor. I am the person right? and my patients yeah. can tell you when there isn't medication and mothers can't afford to buy it. Here, mommy, go and buy the medication. Here, mommy, take it. So you're giving them money now, like you actually <laughs> subsidizing. Do you know what it's like to have somebody before sure you is... with a sick child yeah. that they can't, can't afford. do anything? And it's real. And I mean, every day. it's everyday scenarios. It's very real. And there are persons that come in there you know, it's sad to speak about, but I'm telling you from experience. Mm. Persons that come in doc, I don't have food today for my kids. It's real. Or well, you check out where they're living, how they're living. Yeah. It's it's everyday situations. So you get into limits. I mean, we watch these things on TV, Asha. We're talking about we're talking about malnourishment now. We're talking about children not getting the right nutrients in order to grow a, a healthy life. And and you know, I'm so happy that you are here, Asha, because a lot of people is lis listen to us talking and I tell them all the time, you know, we get all of these comments on us bashing and bashing, but a lot of people don't take the time and take two steps out of Georgetown. Don't talk from North America like you understand what's happening to the people and you're reading headlines of flourishing, but but yet you have, and, and I'm sorry, you're only as strong as your weakest link. Exactly. You got, you got such a large percentage of our population so that are really right. suffering. The social system in Ghana needs a desperate makeover yeah. for cases like this. There's food for the poor, yes, but do what you we know, about charity organizations? Do you know people can't sustain the themselves. Hell that people go through even to get help from there. Yeah. There is the monthly subsidy of 14,000 disability. Fourteen thousand dollars. Fourteen thousand Guyana dollars. Guyana dollars. A child or an adult is given who has a disability. Who can't walk? They can't even buy. They can't even fix they their, their wheelchair at the end of the at the end of the month. Sometimes governments put on twenty five thousand every now and then. Right. Well, they appreciate it, believe oh, me. But this but, is making you dependent on waiting for handouts. Okay, the persons who um, visual hearing mm -hmm. aids. Today somebody came to my house to tell me, Doc, I went in and they told me because I'm an adult, I can't get a hearing aid. The cost mm -hmm. is six to 7,000. Can you help me raise this money? But we have a government. Yeah. We have a Ministry of Health. Uh, we have a blooming oil and gas industry. But what what funds are going into the social system for these persons who are not But working? Asha, I don't even, I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit here. And this is what gets me most upset. Okay, there are extreme cases 
where people do need assistance from the state. I get that. But, but, but Asha, you don't unless... You give a man a fish. Exactly. You unless you're giving these fish. people the opportunity to sustain themselves, how long are they going to keep running back and begging for more? Exactly. That's all you're making them do. You're just keeping them begging. Yes. Okay? And, and I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I tell people this all the time. I come, I grew up, I went to college in a system in Canada that has one of the most robust healthcare systems in the world. Okay, top three in the world for standard of living. So I actually have lived in a system to see what a government can do to help. And I'm sitting here watching and I'm every day I wonder, why are they not doing this? Okay, All right? from a different point of like, view, I have lived in Africa in a village for mm -hmm. eight years. Yeah. And I can tell you infrastructure, medical care, education, feeding programs in school, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was better than Guyana, who is an oil and gas booming nation. I was in a village in Africa mm -hmm. and it was better. Well, look at that. Look at that. Asha, you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where, and, and, and people wonder again why we do this. And we're watching, you know, I, I was in Esquibo reason, as I mentioned, and it really took me aback because I watched big rice farmers and sat down and listened to them and small rice farmers with seven, eight acres and big rice farmers with three, four, five hundred acres, some of them with 2,000 acres. And Asha, their conversation is exactly the same. They, they, they even gave me a breakdown of, of what it is costing them on a daily basis. And those people showed me that they, on, on 25 acres of land, they're not even making minimum wage. They're not even making $80,000 profit. Wow. And what I say that for is not only to show representation and solidarity that we know what these agriculture farmers are going through, but more importantly, they are headed down a road to become more dependent on the government. And it's, 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 it's a cycle that, and this is what bothers me the most, Asha. We are watching these cycles be created. And then two days later, you can see a big headlines. Don't worry, government working on this. Everybody goes, yay, thank God. Not knowing that they are the ones that created it to begin with. You see, something that persons criticized was um, Forbes Barnum. Mm -hmm. I think he had the right idea, but it wasn't executed properly. Okay. Our local content and our farmers could be supported. Why are we importing things that mm -hmm. our farmers are planting right here? Yeah. It's being imported. It's cheaper when you import it, but support them yeah. to be able to Absolutely. compete with international prices. Absolutely. And stop the importation. Explain of that are here. how is it possible that I could bring in something that's planted right here in Guyana for cheaper than we are? Did you see growing? the article about importing sand? Yeah, <laughs> that's. <laughs> it's the same concept. Sand gone up for like six to thousand dollars a truckload now. You know. Yes. Do you know that? All the contractors have been calling, complaining. All everybody is saying like, Doc, what we can do? Why, why government bringing in from yeah. overseas now? Instead of sitting with all of them, having a conversation, see how you can support them so you could continue to buy from the local yeah. market. We run overseas. Actually, this is a big issue that I had when it came to these new houses, this zinc sheet house, oh and this my. clay, and this, and this, um, this, we call it recycled plastic house. <laughs> the guy called it the chicken coop. <laughs> right. So my, my main issue with that, funny enough, was... You know, there are different types of, of, of technology and materials that can be used. Granted, I'm a little weary of the ones they're using because they've never been tested in Guyana. It's just as far as I'm concerned, it's just the government giving their friend a chance to, you know, using taxpayer money to get a friend a contract. But what I have a problem with with that is when you remove the traditional ways of doing things, which is you're using wood to build roof rafters, you got, you're getting your zinc, then you're using the, 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 the sand and concrete blocks to build the walls and the foundation. What you're doing there is that same sand man is losing. You have to look at the supply chain that you're affecting. The man that in the bush, the, the, the timber worker that cut in wood the, to make them rafters, right? Or to make, you know, the, the, the siding for the walls. Instead of you going to use plastic bricks. Pla I don't even know plastic brick. Um, you, you're taking away his job. You're reducing his um income in the his local income content. right the sand man the concrete man the man who does you see a decided road making concrete blocks why not inject money into their business exactly. allow them to build more blocks but and can, you got more supply and to be fair one of the industries that i 
support that mm -hmm. is being pushed by the PPP right now Done. is the housing industry. Mm -hmm. I think Minister Good. Kroll and Minister Rogers have been doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. I see them in the communities, meeting with the people, reaching out to persons who applied years ago, trying to bring it back up to date, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a negative impact on them with the zinc sheet homes that there were 50 that yeah. were constructed. But then I came to understand that the models that were presented to them and what was actually built, you know, it was kind of different. Okay. But I am hoping and the Guyanese people are hoping that yeah. that is discontinued because clearly $5 million for a recyclable mm. home is too much. Yeah. Two million, one point five. okay, yeah. zinc sheet and wood, yeah. you know. Keep it affordable. Yes. And, and I, I, it's obviously very important and you're exactly right. I do agree. I think in the general context of making homes available yes. to citizens is important. OK, making that possibility, uh, you know, but it needs to be done in a sustainable manner. Yes. I think that is where the clash comes in. Yes. Give let people get homes, let, you know, single parents, um, um, you know, the elderly, you know, you, we're not short on homeless people. Take a drive down any well, street. Well, Kian, town, I am but... actually of the strong opinion that every Guyanese citizen mm -hmm. should have a piece of land free. That's my policy. Well, you're born here, you're a Guyanese. Our population is less than a million. So let me talk to you about something very important. And I, and I you know, it's, it, we always talk about solution based and coming up with ideas in order to make sure it's sustainable. And, you know, we have this big issue right now. And all Guyanese will tell you, all Guyanese living in Guyana will tell you that the system is unfairly designed for foreigners, and I mean foreigners mean even the diaspora, yeah. to come back to Guyana. Because you know you live out of Guyana for four years, you come back to Guyana, you get duty-free car, you get to bring in all your materials tax-free, you get all of these benefits. All right? The local man that lives here, born here, grew up here his whole life, he has no possibility in the world of getting any of those things. All right? So we obviously are in a position right now where the Guyanese in Guyana are put at a disadvantage. Yes. And I can tell you that even in a business context. If I, you know, when we watch these big restaurants or, or, or these big oil companies or any of these, even garbage companies or whatever you, you want to call them, you know, in every industry, they come in here with their investment and they get all of these tax concessions. But the local companies that are doing it right now cannot get it, right? That's, that's a very interesting point. And if you study or observe the format that countries mm -hmm. like Qatar, Dubai, um, the Bahamas used yeah. when their industry started to bloom the first thing they did was remove tax from the citizens so not the citizens sorry that's where I was going with this the residents the and residents, this is very yes. important please make sure people understand that don't you cannot expect to reap the benefits mm -hmm. of what Guyana is producing if you are not contributing. Yes, yes. Okay, you have to be paying your taxes here for a certain yes. amount of years. You have to be part of our society and contributing back to what yes. the, the exactly. pool is. Exactly. But that's the first yeah. thing they did. When persons have more money in their pockets, it's more spending power. The money goes right back into the economy right here and it builds Guyana. We haven't seen any improvement mm. in that aspect. Yeah. Income tax still remains ridiculously oh my gosh. high. That's craziness. It's almost 50% for corporate are, taxes now, for yeah. corporate income tax. It's yes, madness. Yes. How are you sustaining that? While certain oil and gas companies enjoy tax-free benefits. Uh, but yet, but yet, At using our electricity. the the Guyanese yeah. person's taxes. Absolutely. Using our roads, broken up with big trucks. We need government to oh, start call. supporting its citizens. Absolutely. I understand Absolutely. business is important. Getting investors Locals to come first. in is Residents important, first. Yep. Yep. but focus on your people. Yeah. Once your people are happy, they yeah. will flourish. Even something as it simple as accessing proven. financing. Yes. Because because when you come in here and your locals, you know what, maybe we might even be more, be more open to the taxation as what it is. If we were earning more, if we were capable of making more. Duty but, free concessions. Right. You know, oh gosh, we could talk about this four door <laughs> pickup thing. Why? It, God only knows why four door pickups are still a hundred and something percent duty or, or 90 percent or whatever it is. And you got to buy a, a two door pickup. Yet you got a construction company and fetching the wrong work because holy nigga sit in the tree. But Asha, it goes back to, to, to you know, simple, basic uh, um, social, as you said, social uh, areas and sectors, meaning something like security. Yes. Look at what's happening in this country with crime. I cannot, every day I open my Facebook, every day I open the newspaper, 
You tell me a day's pass without some murder. Somebody, we watching some video on some cameras choke and rob. I have a restaurant. I have about 30 staff. Uh, on a weekly basis, one of them is getting robbed going home or, or, or something along those lines. So, on a weekly basis. So Kian, as much as a picture is painted that everything is lovely, well, if you want to know if a country is doing well, you look at the security. Mm -hmm. You look at the value of the money in the country, yeah. the dollar, in comparison to the US, the yen, the euro, the Canadians. Mm -hmm. We're still extremely low. Yes, okay. they put out articles saying that they can't raise it extremely fast, but yeah. it's not improving at all. Yeah, yeah. What's happening there? Mm -hmm. the, if you pay attention to the crime that's happening, it's petty thieves, persons stealing to survive, few isolated cases of big business yeah. kind of involvement. Yeah. But it shows that these persons have issues. Mm -hmm. They're doing it out of need. Yeah, absolutely. Our people need to be safe. If everybody's comfortable, these things wouldn't happen. So tell me, talk to me, Asha. You're going into parliament. And we know that as 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 people, you know, I, I like to make a joke. We like to talk. All right. <laughs> we like to talk. All right. We can talk about all the bad and all the good in the world. Asha, you tell me going into parliament because uh, you know, you you're you're poised right now because you know I, I you know, we can release a little secret that you're you know, you're on the front burner for TNM and you know in consultation with Anu right now to go into parliament next talk to me a little bit on what you need to to, to get to the guy these people you talk to me about what you want to put on the burner the front burner when you get in there Kian, there is so much mm -hmm. in consultation with our experts with you with mm -hmm. anug with ljp with everyone i think we need to work on improving the social system okay. that's something I would like to focus on issues that benefit the Guyanese people. Every Guyanese person. Business, unemployed. Get into some details, man. Talk to me. I want to hear like specific issues. You're on the hot seat here. Eh? I want to hear <laughs> some specific. Close to your heart. Talk to me about what you know. Talk to me about what you can stand up there and tell the public, the Guyanese, or everybody watching right now. And then when you get into parliament, what you can look at that government or, and that main opposition and say, this is what you guys failed with. This is what needs to be done better. Talk to me. All right. So the first thing I will be addressing is constitutional reform Excellent. in order to benefit the Guyanese people. Mm -hmm. We are trying to move away from that two-party system. Good. So our Jaina made history, we started. So now I will be standing up to give the Jaina proper representation constitutionally. It should be put into writing. Okay. All right. I would like to see a better lifestyle for the disabled, the okay. pensioners, the persons who cannot the work The vulnerable and help in society. Themselves. The vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. That's very close to my heart. It hurts you so much to see somebody with one leg who cannot work living on $14,000 a month. Yeah. I would like to see better for the women. Mm. The suicide rates in Ghana are horrible. Yeah, you know as a doctor how bad Domestic it is. abuse, mm. rape. These are real issues that I see on a daily basis. Why are rapists still walking free? Yeah. Why are rapists being let off? I would like to impose strict laws against child rapists and these persons. I don't want to see them walking free anymore. No mother should ever have to live knowing that yeah. persons who abuse their children are still out there. Yeah. Right? Where the health system is concerned, I would like to propose improvements where the staff in the health system are incentivized to stay. Good. Not just money-wise. But if you can't afford to raise a salary right now, something else that, yeah. right? Well, Working conditions, facilities. Everything uh, like that. Mm -hmm. It needs to be improved. Our health system needs a reboot right now. Yeah. They're working on it. They said we're all observing, but I will be talking about policies to help improve that. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. You see, that, that's, that's what I think is necessary for the country to move forward. Because what I have found, Asha, is such a detachment from the government and the politicians even the opposition as to what is really going on in 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 these areas you know what is really going on in these facilities and another thing you will hear me singing all the time non-stop is transparency if i can get the policy in place constitutionally yeah. about transparency absolutely it will be there yeah. And don't get me wrong, I have no intention of standing there and fighting against government, mm -hmm. even as I sit here. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. 
I have a sincere desire to bring awareness to the issues, the real issues that are affecting the people on the ground. Yeah. Ministers can sit in an office, the president, he goes out there every now and then, but I'm with the people every day. Yeah. Every single day of my life, that is where I am, with the people of Ghana, in the community. In their most vulnerable. Yeah. In their most vulnerable state. Yeah. So I know what are the issues that are affecting them. So I would like to bring light to this. So once it's highlighted, to get the cooperation from opposition and government to help mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. That's my main purpose. Every Guyanese citizen should be comfortable, should be safe, should be happy, yeah. should be provided for health wise, should have access to proper education. I mean, the Gold Scholarship Initiative, you know, it's really good. I see them targeting interior areas, which hasn't been done previously. More persons have enrolled this year, they've started. But goal is, I, 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 education is education, great, but I, I can, my, my one kick with education is UG. And I, that's I, I, where I'm getting right now. Yeah. All right, that's where I I'm getting. I don't think getting. it's acceptable. Yeah. That's where I'm getting. So they've started online goal scholarships, mm -hmm. really good initiative. I yeah, love agreed. it. Priya has agreed. been out there. But Guyana being Guyana right now, mm -hmm. we need a proper university. Absolutely. We need better fees for our citizens that could be covered partially by government. They campaign. Uh, it's like constitutional. It's supposed to be free. They, yeah, I don't exactly. even know who has decided to break the constitution. They campaign yeah. free education for our yeah. citizens. If you talk to any professor at the University of Ghana, they complain about the structure, the lack of resources, simple things like printers, papers. Why is our main educational institution having issues like this to a day yeah. like today? Why isn't education free? If not free, why isn't it affordable enough <laughs> so that every person has a chance without going through a scholarship and being bonded to government for all these years? Yeah. It's, it's not right. And, and Asha, what I'd like to point out in all of what we're saying, and I think this is probably the most important thing, is understanding that previous to, to, to 2015, okay. you could have heard, oh, you know, Guyana might not be making as much money or third row, not, which I, I disagree with that then too. But even more so now, money's not the issue. I don't want to hear we don't have the money to do it do because we all know that's nonsense. I agree with the third world mentality. Yeah. The resources that our yeah. country has that is reaped and raped mm -hmm. by quote unquote first world countries who have nothing. Mm -hmm. Who is first and who is third? You come to us to get these resources, <laughs> yet you label me as a third world country. That's yeah. unacceptable. Yep. yep. Absolutely. We have the wealth. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, you know, um, one of these issues that, uh, you know, let, let, let's switch gears for a second. You know, one of these things I want to talk, because we don't have a lot of time left, um, is we recently watched, uh, we recently watched uh, um, the issue that came, that was plastered on the headlines again, of the ARIO, I believe it was, for Region 4. Oh. And the chairman had a clash. Daniel C. Ram, I think, um, is the chairman of, of Region 4 at the moment. And, you know, it was really, really sad to see. And I want to bring it up because I want to ask your opinion on it because I know it's something you, you looked at. What, um, you know, the, the chairman did his speech at, at the ceremony and then the, the REO came and snatched the, 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 the mic out of his hand when he was trying to bring up one of the opposition MP, Ms. Catherine Hughes, to say a few words. And he said, no, he's not accepting anything else. And, you know, it's something that was a little heartbreaking for me because, again, coming from a third party perspective, at what point in time are we going to watch these organizations work together? And, you know, I watched the president preaching this one Guyana scenario and we're back to square one of these petty clashes only driving a wedge between the people. It's actually one me. Guyana and anybody who disagrees with us yeah. that's the perspective one Guyana and anybody who disagree disagrees it doesn't matter AP and you and TNM the man on the corner which is quite sad I don't believe in one Guyana well talk to me that's what I want to ask you about talk to me about about going into Parliament and what your opinion I is on something in like this unity and diversity mm -hmm. we need to acknowledge each Guyanese citizens for their individuality mm -hmm. acknowledge each culture acknowledge each race, mm -hmm. accept them for who they are. They don't need to be one. Yeah. They need to be accepted yeah. in all their diversity. 
that disrespect to the the chairman and the REO that happened that was so distasteful yeah it's like at what level is enough enough yeah you're so brazen to grab a microphone from somebody mm -hmm. Suppress somebody from speaking or saying what they have to say. What do you have to hide? Yeah. That, that's what came to my mind when I saw it and many persons. Why is he preventing them from speaking? Yeah. At the end of the day, you need to acknowledge there is an opposition. There is government. And there is us, individual, yeah. independent opposition. Yeah. Everybody should be given a right to say what they have to say. If you disagree, handle it professionally. Uh, absolutely. I think, I think that was the most disheartening side because if you listen to... To see Ram's speech previous to to, to calling uh, M MP Hughes up, it was very much one Guyana, very much you know celebrating unity and so on. And it was again, it was one of those instances that you know um, that that really was was left you wondering if this is just a facade or if it's if everybody is on board with this one Guyana idea because. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know if you know the aftermath, but they had held a no-confidence motion against the Ariona. He's now removed. Oh, yeah. So I found that very interesting too. Again, more of a shift in dynamic because what we find now is more people being isolated, more, more tension, more friction. And again, only the people of the country suffering. While, you know, I go right back into the, what I started with, yeah, listen to press a conference. A real issue faced by our yeah. people on a daily basis is political victimization. Okay. Countless persons have reached out to me. Countless persons call, message, text, doc. We can't do anything in our workplace. We're being victimized. Um, mm -hmm. If we speak out against something, we're threatened that we'll lose our jobs. It's, yeah. I cannot sit here and say this has happened to me. Yeah. It hasn't. But persons do reach out and say that they're experiencing this on a daily basis. But, but, but so that's... Well, I, Asha, you know... That really leads me to wonder if the tiger changed its stripes. Because I remember pre-2015, who is my way or the highway? Yeah. And you wonder where, at what point in time, the people of this country are going to realize that this is your taxpaying money. But you are in charge. These people work very for you. What is very interesting that this has been happening on the both APNU and PPP. Mm -hmm. Because while APNU was in power, persons still complained about that. Absolutely, absolutely. And the solution APNU to that, is just as, as guilty as this. The solution is to get rid of that two-party system. Two-party system. I like it, Asha. That is exactly right. And and to be honest, on that note, um, you know, uh, I think one of the main cons. I know, I know you discussing the forefront of constitutional reform, and I know what happens is a lot of people don't particularly understand. Well, what do you want to reform in the constitution? Right. That's just a word. Constitutional reform. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think these are certain things that people need to start understanding are the core of how our country governs and functions yeah. where I, I'm, I'm going to tell you when, when I hear constitutional reform, I actually think of taking power away from politicians. No. I actually want the power to go more back down to the people, because <laughs> what I believe is, you know, the, from the time you vote this any government in in this country, all of a sudden you are working for them. Yeah. And I want to see more of independence, constituency-based representation and independent soci um, um, social society circles where people can say, excuse me, this is our money. Yes. You don't get to dictate what this area is doing with it. Right. And, and what these people want. I want MPs to be voted into parliament based on who they represent yes. as the people, not the party. Yes. Don't come. This list system is a problem because all of a sudden you got a man gone into a seat that that that, um, the, the, you know, New Amsterdam one or, or, or region region five and six one. And then all of a sudden he is no longer working towards helping the people of of that's, five and six, but he helping the PPP that's exactly or the PNC. It. That's and exactly it's, it's, it's not the working. forefront of what I yeah. will be speaking on, the constitutional yeah. reform. Persons need to have the ability to select who they want to represent them. And by merits only, they be in parliament. Yeah. It, it's needed. The Guyanese people deserve to have that system. Why? Why are we? If we, if we, if if you hear the like I said, the press conference today, all I hear is how bad APNU is. Ali, but yet the taxpayers still funding them. Oh, Kian, I am so sick and tired of hearing 
of hearing the tit for tat, the t- blame game. The Apnu did this, and the PPP did that, and Apnu is evil, they rigged, and PPP nepotism. <laughs> Corrupt and this and, and, and I'm and so forth. tired of it. While everybody's being distracted by the tit and tat and titter of daddy and mommy, the people are in need. Yeah. And the focus is not going towards the people of Ghana, but towards the little feud between Apnu and PPP, really. Yep. Asha, you hit the nail on the head here. Yeah, and, and and I hope I will, and hope one of the things you you can you can try to get them since since even the government agrees that the main opposition is an issue. I hope we can get some constitutional reform where we can see more. Um, we can see the 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 even if the funding is going to all of the opposition, not just one party in the opposition. Kian, could you imagine what we could do with three million dollars a month for the Guyanese people yeah. transparently? Yep, yep, yep. Community wise, playgrounds are still being requested. Yeah. Mothers need help for their children to go to school. Feeding programs in homes that you, you know, know what have. the funny part is, Asha, is I like I like the idea of of that money actually coming to organizations that are doing real work on an everyday basis. Here's what I like. I like sure. that nobody in 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 TNM or Anug work. Um, work for the government solely. I'm meaning we are not dependent on taxpayers. Yeah. But I like that all the politicians in these two organizations are working people and functioning parts of society. We are not depending on taxpayers' money. Yeah. So we know what everyone is dealing with because we have to deal with it too. We got to pay those taxes. You got to work in the health Just system. Just like the guy every day and depend on it. at home, every time I yeah. look at my pay slip like this and I see the taxes, the pain they feel, I feel okay. it too. On that note, we're going to make sure that the first thing Asha says in Parliament is that we are advocating for a cut in PAYE. Okay, this is nonsense. <laughs> Nobody taking out thirty percent of his salary anymore and can't get nothing for it. All right. Yes. This is the, the, the one out the door. This is uh, this is a promise that we will be advocating yes, for. Yes. All right. It, it, it's unacceptable. Asha. On that note, it is seven thirty and it is the end of our show. I thank you so much for coming and I hope I hope you are going to be back soon once you get into Parliament. Once you get your hands dirty, we can get you back in it and bring you back here and let me. Let's get some ventilated ideas of what's really happening inside there. All right? Thank you so much for having me, Kian. And I mean? would like uh-huh. the Guyanese people to know that we're here to represent them, independent of government and opposition. Mm-hmm. And any issues they have, they should feel free to reach out to us because we are here for them. Great. Don't tell me, tell them. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you doing for Pagua? We all the Guyanese. Happy Pagua. What's your plans? Happy Pagua, everyone. Remember to be <laughs> responsible. Don't drink and drive. And whatever your religion is, remember that growing up, we all celebrated as children. So respect each other and be happy. <laughs> On that note, everyone, it is a pleasure having you again once uh, once more here on a beautiful Friday night in Georgetown. Um, thank you for watching A Politically Incorrect. My name is Kian Jabour, and as usual, I'm your host. I'm back here next Friday, and I hope you all can join me then. Thanks.